CCM, and then we had um, black gospel music. And part of my dissertation is talking about, uh, like I said, the black side of CCM or the black side of the Jesus movement, where we have Andre Crouch, we have Edwin Hawkins, his brother Walter Carlton Hawkins, and then we have also have James Cleveland. But then we jump up to, I would say, 200, I mean, 2010. Every praise is do our God. Yeah. This is also gospel music with, with a rock beat. If you listen to, um, oh God, Hezekiah Walker, you hear blaring, uh, blaring guitars. You know, you know, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship. Every praise, every praise, every praise to our God. To our God. Yeah. 
took you from the Negro spiritual that happened um, during the slave time, where, where the West Africans were captured from Africa mm -hmm. and came to America, and, uh, and they sang the Negro spirituals. And then from there, we have, they moved from field to factory, to the cities. And they brought their music with them. And when they brought their music with them, I'm just giving y'all a heads up because we're going to go over this again. When they brought their music with them, they brought along with them the people who were in the juke joints, mm -hmm. the people who were, who were playing the clubs, and then God got a hold of them. So we said God got a hold of them and saved them. And they didn't leave their rhythm and blues at the door. They brought the rhythm and blues with them, and they added to the spirit, to the what we call the congregational spiritual, and came glory, glory, hallelujah. That's what I was singing. Glory, glory, hallelujah, right? Since hallelujah, and they can do that all night long, all night long, and that's the reason why. We'll talk about that. And then we move on up to the 1950s and the 60s, where we have, um, James Cleveland, who would create, um, not necessarily create the three-part harmony, but he solidified the three-part harmony. It was Manny Moss Clark who created the three-part harmony for the choir. But then uh, James Cleveland was the one who codified it and solidified it with a, with a song called Peace Be Still. That song is still played. And I guarantee you, if, if you play that song in a graveyard, there'll be a lot of people coming up throwing, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> because that song solidified gospel music and gospel music recording. And then we move on to the, the late 60s, where we have the Jesus movement. There were black hippies and there were white hippies. CCM produced, um, CCM was produced by the white hippies and the Calvary Chapel, because Pastor Chuck Smith would go over to California and he would, he would go there and find the hippies on the beach and we love Jesus, Lord. You love Jesus, come on the church and let me tell you more about it. And we have a lot of music that has been produced by them. The, um, the CCM is, a, is a, originated from that time. But then we have contemporary black gospel music where a host of men and women were involved. And believe it or not, just like CCM started in San Francisco, about 10 miles east, when you cross the Bay Bridge, was a young man writing songs like we just finished singing, like, I heard the voice. He wrote the one, oh, happy day, oh, happy day. That was Edwin Hawkins. And then if you travel down to, uh, down south about five hours in California, just north of Los Angeles, California, you'll, you'll find a black, another black young man, and he was writing, the blood that Jesus shed for me. He was 14 years old when he wrote that. 14. You know, how many have heard that song? Way back on Calvary. So, John, uh, that was Andre Crouch who wrote that. And then we have, so we have Evan Hawkins, and then later in early, in early 1970s, we have Walter Hawkins, who used to sing with his brother Edwin Hawkins, and they produced an album called um, Love Alive. Love Alive has since had Love Alive, Love Alive 2, Love Alive 3, Love Alive 4, Love Alive 5. He had more records than the Rocky series. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Walter Hawkins that really established like a canon of gospel music for black church choirs, along with James Cleveland. So let's start with the black church. It all started with the black church. Before I continue on, do you have any questions? Because we're going to move mighty quickly. I have one because I feel like I might have missed what CCM was. Contemporary Christian music. There we go. Thank you. CCM is contemporary Christian music. And I work at Liberty University, and that's what really what we major in, contemporary Christian music. You know, so let's move on to the black church and talking about black uh, worship. Now, I'm going to need help because I'm what we call a, a digital immigrant because I was born in 65. I got you. <laughs> oh, look at the two sons. 
I learned that. Nice. <laughs> the, the baby boom generation, and I would say up until 1970, we're, we're, we're immigrants to the technology. And these young folk, I love them, they were born with <laughs> um, microwaves and push button things. And they just knew all that stuff. Telephones in their hands. I love y'all. Y'all got to be patient with us. <laughs> all right, so we're talking about. Um, the history, the history of worship in the black church. Move to the next one, please. My friend was one and two. So we have the history. The black West Africans arrived in America. We're going to talk about the African aesthetic, which is kinship. We're going to talk about the Western response to Euro American Christianity. That's important. Euro American Christianity and the invisible institution. We're just going to touch on two pastors, one male and one female and the beginning of the black church and the different denominations and the sacraments of worship. This was started um, with the slaves, with, with West Indian slaves. So when West Indians arrived in America, West Africans, West Africans arrived in America, thank you because we're recording this. <laughs> um, they arrived in Jamestown in August of 1619. Uh, Point, Port, Port Point Comfort, now called Hampton Roads on the White Lion, there's a private English private uh, ship. There were 20 enslaved Africans from, from the city or from the country known now as Angola. They were indentured servants. Mm -hmm. Indentured servants meant that their time to be servants was, going, was limited. So they were going to be servants for a short period of time. And then they were going to be released. So they came over not as you know slaves like what like happened later on, but as indentured servants. And move on to the next one, please. So this thing called kinship. When I ask you to come and say hello and let's try to make you feel comfortable and at home, that's what the African uh, kinship is all about: making people feel at home. There are other cultures that do the same thing, but when when the, Af when the West Africans became slaves, they became slaves on a slave ship that gathered people from different areas of that, of that continent. They, they didn't speak the same language, um, they didn't eat the same foods, and they were from different uh, levels in their own culture. But to the, to the slave masters and to the slavers, they were Africans who had the same skin and so they threw them all in the bottom of the ship. And one of the things that they did have is, of course, their same skin, but they were all in the same predicament. They were all slaves. They were all slaves. And when they finally landed in the United States, I'm maybe getting ahead of myself, um, their culture, their language, their names, every part of them was taken away from them. But they had one thing in common, a couple of things in common, and that is the drum beat. They knew how to beat a drum, and when they beat the drum, there was a signal, and they understood that. The other thing that was uh, that's called kinship for them was the fact that they could sing. They couldn't take their song away from the West Africans. They couldn't take the beat away from the West Africans. And though they tried to Christianize the West Africans, I believe, I might have to find proof, but I believe they met God before they got on the ship and went to Africa. But we're gonna find that out later on down through the years. Mm -hmm. Next one. So, according to Miss Dr. Costins, um, African aesthetic kinship is like a vast network stretching literally and horizontally in every direction, in, embracing everybody in every local group. I think we do that today as well in some instances in the, in the African-American culture here in America. It comes from the African aesthetic, the kinship. We all in the same boat, literally, at that time, and we all on the same ship, and we all have to love each other. That's all we got is each other. Next one. And part of that kinship grew out music, worship, fellowship, and community. 
I was trying to bring us together as a community in this room through music. That's why I was asking you to clap your hand. You better be glad. I can tell you, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor! <laughs> God says I love you. Next yeah. one, please. <laughs> Don't get him started. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an interesting thing. Um, the West African response to Euro-American Christianity. Now, I want you to pretend like I am the Atlantic Ocean. Got it? Right here is like the horn, not the horn, the horn of Africa is on that side. This is Africa. And then that big hump right there, and it goes down this way. So about right here in West Africa is where the trade began. So they, they traded here, and over here is South America, I'm Atlantic, South America, and then the islands, and then uh, America and the coast. And then over here, I guess right over here would be uh, England. So there was like a diamond like that. That's what they would do. All right? So now let's talk about at Christianity. Christianity came from the other side of Africa in, in, um, in Israel, and it went over the Mediterranean Sea, traveled through Europe, and then came to America. That's European Christianity. We have African Christianity as well, which has not been studied yet. <laughs> but I believe that the Africans knew about Jesus, they knew about God and everything, before they got on that boat, they knew about their God. Not just the African God, but a God that came from Europe, I mean, they came from Jerusalem, right? So, get them over here to America through by way of European uh, Christianity. So the slave masters felt like the religion would make the slaves very docile and obedient. And so that's why they felt like we're gonna make the slaves Christians. Next slide, please. But the slaves saw, they, they heard about Jesus, they heard about Moses, mm -hmm. and they heard about the Israelites being enslaved, mm -hmm. and they're like, huh. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. That was like the first resistance <laughs> of slave of slavery, but the African, I mean, the slave masters didn't understand that that was a resistance song. So, you know, they're, they're hoeing, they're row, and they're looking at the slave master going, go down, Moses, way down in Egypt, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, they were thinking, if Jesus can save the Israelites and give them freedom, he can definitely save us and give us freedom. So that's what they were thinking. They weren't thinking we're going to be docile and obedient. We are docile and obedient. It's going to be to God so that we can be free. Next. So they're responding to the to gospel in a unique way. Those receiving the religious instruction receive freedom in Christ, freedom from human bondage, and freedom from interaction with Christians. There's a book around here that uh, that is called 200 yeah these are these are my, not all of them but most of them all these are my books that I have that I have in my library and I'm working on my master I work on my master's degree got these and dissertation from a PhD one of the things is called the Af one of the books is called the African prayers of the African American 200 years and it's called uh, I will talk with God talking with God for 200 years and you can tell those receiving the religious instruction receive freedom in Christ, and though they were in chains in real life, they felt free in Jesus Christ and knowing who God is. Next slide. So the history of worship in the black church, module two, which is going really fast. Preachers, pastors, and evangelists. Next. There were slave preachers who lived on the plantations. These were itinerant, they were, they were illiterate. Uh, and they were showmen, and they were colorful, but with colorful illustrations. And here it is, they were supervised by the slave masters and white overseers. There were two sermons that would go on, on the plantation. When the white overseer was there, and the black preacher would come and speak to the slaves, he would tell them, now you know good and well, we all need to be loving God, and loving our masters, and we need to be obedient to God, and obedient to our masters, and they're right. And they would somberly look and sort of obey. Yeah, that's true, that's true. 
It's the Bible, right? But then what they would do is, after they finished their long days of work, you ever heard the song called, I'm going to lay down my burden down by the riverside, down by the, they would go down by the riverside and have church the African aesthetic way, in the kinship way. They would worship by the riverside. Now, these Africans were looked at as dumb and illiterate. But when these people would go down there, how many of you heard of a soundproof room? Been in a soundproof room? Well, they would make the area soundproof. They would find bushes. They would find trees where, you know, tree falls in the forest and nobody's around. Could you hear it? They understood that. They would go down to the riverside. They would take their quilts. They would take their heavy blankets. What do you think they would do with those? Go on down by the riverside. They would dump or dunk the blankets and the quilts and water. They would hang them up on the trees. And then they would, for some reason, they had this pot. They would turn the pot over and then they would sing as loud as they can. They would worship God in the African way as best as they can because the blankets deadened their sound. They couldn't, nobody could hear anything. First of all, you're in a, you're in a gully, but then you put, the, you put the blankets up that were wet. The, 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 the sound would be absorbed in the material. Now these dumb Africans figured that out. I'm thinking, no, God, when he got, when he made us, he gave us the imagination. Though the, he gave us the imagination and the creativity that he gave Adam and Eve. And though they were not in their place in Africa, that imagination and that creativity, they couldn't beat it out of them, they couldn't whip it out of them, they couldn't do anything, it was still there. So they took it, and here's one thing, what they would do is, they would also, you know, they would go, you know, down by the river, start hoeing and picking cotton, telling everybody, we're way down by the river, down by the river, side. that was a signal telling everybody, we're going to have church after the day is over. And where is it? Where is it going to be? Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, right? Ain't going to study word no more. So one of the things they would do is as they're walking through the woods, they would bend the branches in the direction of where church was going to take place. So you walk, and you, they, would, they, they would notice how to bend the branch. Because they, they would mark it, but they, just, they would bend the branch. So you know that this is the right way to get to the church, the right way we're going to have church. So that's just one thing that I loved about um, the history of the black church. Keep going, next one, please. This is one of the pastors. He's out of Richmond, Virginia, called John Jasper. The sun do move. The sun do move. That was one of his famous, famous religious, or uh, famous um, uh, sermons. People would come from all around to hear this black man preach about the sun do move. And uh, we all know that the earth revolves around the sun, but what he was trying to make a point that we serve a God that could make the sun move. But because he was of this persuasion and came from slavery, they thought the people who were, you know, didn't look like them, thought that, oh, he's just another ignorant one or another ignorant one. But he was getting the gospel across, telling the people how powerful God is. And his church grew. He was a man of faith. And it's the, his church is still uh, established down in um, Richmond. So he was one of the most popular preachers in Richmond area, famous for the sun, the sun to move. He preached over 250 times. People would come from miles around. I'm like, New York, D.C., back at those times, driving down to 6th Street Mount Baptist Church. Yeah, 6th Mount but Baptist, Baptist, Sixth Mount Baptist Church. That's what he would do. He would be preaching down there, and they would come and see him. Next, please. And this lady here, she was an amazing woman. She was an itinerant preacher. She was ordained by Bishop Allen of the AME Church. She preached during the Second Great Awakening. Uh, she's the first African-American woman to write her own biography. She did it three times. She had three editions. Now, remember now, these people were illiterate. These people could not, and it was, it was illegal for the slave 
to be taught how to read and write. But she did it. And not only that, she was a woman who traveled over 2,000 miles, somewhere between D.C., Baltimore, Pennsylvania, Ohio, in that area. There were no, of course there were horses, but she walked, she rode the horse, but she preached. So this is one of the, one of the first African-American female evangelists. There was like five or six of them. Next. So the black church, it began in the antebellum South in secret meetings down by the riverside. And they called it the invisible institution. One of the, one of the places, if they couldn't meet down by the riverside, then the slave owners would allow them to meet in slave quarters. Well, we're, 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 well, this was, we split this in half for to be slave quarters. They made, they call them praise houses, where the slave owners would allow the slaves, the enslaved Africans, to go and worship God the way they wanted to. And so, during slave times, um, they called it the invisible institution, and they produced a musical coding to make announcements. How many of you seen Harriet, the movie Harriet? Okay, well, did you notice that when she went to tell her mama she was about to leave, she said she was singing from her tree. She was like, I'm going to see my Lord, whatever it was, right? And they would call and they thought, like, okay, she knew exactly what was gonna happen. She knew that her, she was going, the mother knew that Harriet was going to be leaving the plantation. And when you leave the plantation and try to go north, you got dogs chasing you, you got slave people chasing you. She knew the hurt and pain that was going to be come, come upon her daughter. So they answered mournfully and woefully, all right, see you when I get there. I'll see you up in heaven when I get All of this was under the nose of the slave masters. They had no idea that they were planning to leave, all right? So we have musical coding, and then we have the African aesthetic, and then we have elements of worship. Singing, praying, preaching, reading scripture, shouting, and fellowship. How many of you have this going on at your church? Is this not a black thing? It goes on at the Presbyterian churches. <laughs> it goes singing, and then you, know, you, you preach, and then you read scriptures. Now, I don't know about the Presbyterian shout. I'm not sure about the Presbyterian I'm shout. shout. Yeah, Baptists <laughs> don't shout. Well, you, you sell them, but they don't shout. The black Baptists, they shouted, this is part of the African-American, I mean the African aesthetic. And then we all fellowship. We have potlucks and things like that. So we all fellowship. So these are the elements of worship with the black church. Keep going. We have the high church and we have the low church. The white Protestant churches, that's the one where it, they, don't, they don't yell, holler, scream, and jump and you know, all that stuff. But they had to be, they were separated. Um, Pastor Allen and a, and a bunch of the congregants were at this white Presbyterian church and they were praying and uh, some of the brothers, the, the white brothers, decided that it was time for the black brothers to leave the church. It was time to go. So a, as they were praying at the altar, the black mothers, I mean brothers and sisters were playing and praying at the altar, some of the white deacons decided, we don't want y'all in here no more. So they tried to kick him out. And Pastor Allen was like, just can we wait until we pray first? Let us finish praying. And so it happened that they got kicked out. But Pastor Allen didn't like the African aesthetic. He didn't, he didn't mind, you know, worshiping and praising the European, uh, God the European way, though they were all Africans. He just decided that we're going to worship God the European, Christ, white Protestant way, the liturgical way, which was fine. And then you have what we call the low church, non-liturgical, independent and free, and enslaved blacks. They're the ones where you go in there and they're clapping and jumping and shouting and you know, clapping their hands and spitting and slobbering and doing worshiping God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, that's the low church, non-liturgical. Next slide. And these are the denominations at that time, the time of uh, 18, well, def definitely the time during slavery and the time after slavery was over. So we're looking at 1800s, 1890, 1890, 1860. Um, the Methodists and the Baptists were the ones that were mainly involved. And then we have the Holiness Pentecostals that were around later on in the late 18, 1800s. Next, please. So we have the African uh, Episcopal Methodist Church of St. Thomas, Absalom Jones, founder. 
Um, and then African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, uh, Richard Allen was the founder. That was the one who was saying, hey, can you just please let us wait until we finish praying? Then we can leave. We won't bother you anymore. And then we have the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in New York, and then the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church in Jackson, Tennessee. It used to, this used to be called the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, CME, but they changed it to Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Next, please. So we have the Baptist, the African Baptist. The first one was Bluestone Church of Mecklenburg, Virginia, established in 1758. But then they argued that no, Silver Bluff said, no, we the first one in South Carolina. So I'll put these up there both just to, just to say that they both are arguing about who started the first one. Next one. Then you have the Baptist Conventions. Now, National Baptist Convention, these are all the African Americans coming together at the National Baptist Convention. Notice the date, 1895. They were free. And it was also during the time of construction. Reconstruction, right? And then the National Baptist Convention in 1915, and then Progressive National Baptist Church, um, Baptist Convention in 1960. Next, please, I'm going through this fast. And the Holiness Churches, uh, Holiness United, um, United Holiness Church of America, 1886. The Fire Baptized Holiness in 1889. Church of God in Christ, I mean, Church of God, Church of Christ Holiness in America. They're not quite sure when they started. Some people say 1895, some people 1897, and then we got Kojic. How many of you are Church of God in Christ? In 1897, and then PAW, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, was started right about the same time as the Azusa Street. Next, please. And in each church, you will have baptism, you'll have communion, you'll have marriages, you have funerals, and you have burials. These are the sacraments of worship that I would say is universal in both black churches and white churches. And believe it or not, these were common during the slavery times as well. When the slaves wanted to get married, they had to ask their master to get married. When the funerals were taking place, there were funerals and there were also burials. So these things, these sacraments of worship was established even before there was a black church during the, um, the invisible institution area, era of the black church. When the slaves were slaves, they had these sacraments of worship going on. I believe is that the last one? Uh, no, that's the one. Oh, okay. So a summary. Three main reasons African American Christians gathered to worship. Corporate offering of thanksgiving to God through Jesus and to be nourished by the word of God. They had two ways of doing it. In front of the slave master and then on their own. They had two ways of doing it. Uh, and then the people would gather as a common root from the, from, uh, that are in Africa. They're all Africans. They know how to worship the African way. And so they decided to do that, uh, to identify with a common struggle that, uh, that was experienced by the, by the African diaspora. So whether they were in Philadelphia, whether you're down in Louisiana, whether you were in Virginia, they understood the African struggle. And then the three reasons um, they were solidified, the reason they were solidified was the invisible institution and to remain as the cornerstone of the black church and worship experience today. Can everybody say amen? Amen. amen? All right, next. That's it. All right. <laughs> All right, now before we move on to the musical portion, do you have any questions? Don't be shamed. Don't be scared. If you have any questions, because we're going to move to the musical portion of it. Let's see. You see where it is? Yeah, that's it. The birth of black gospel music. Okay. So when I started this, I want to call it a lecture, I guess, um, I started with the Negro spiritual. I, was trying, I should have moved on this far. started with the Negro spiritual. Then we moved on over to the congregational spiritual. Then we moved on over to where the three-part harmony was solidified with James Cleveland. Then we moved on over to the Jesus movement and what I would call the four forefathers of gospel music, and that would be James Cleveland, the Hawkins brothers, and Andre Crouch. How many of you heard of any one of those people? Andre Crouch, okay, so, now one of the things I like to do is, for the sake of time, I like to have two, two volunteers. 
Two volunteers right now. Two volunteers. <laughs> One, good. Introduce yourselves. I hope we're not singing. No, you're going to sing later. No, 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 no. You're going to be singing. Don't worry. Let me do this right here. There we go. Oh, Father, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And I want you to, let me see how much. I want you to start over here. Good. And we're going to have what I, and I need one more person. Who who can write well? Who's got good, do you have good penmanship? Who's got good penmanship? I do not. She doesn't, I know. Uh, you oh, got good penmanship? Call me out. Can somebody else take her spot? Because we're going to be some writing. We're going to do some writing. Wait, one more volunteer. There we go. There we go. Am I writing over here? See this? All right, so hand over there. Because what I'm going to do now is we're going to have a living timeline as we talk about. Oh, okay, so Matt, hold on right here. Hold on. Get right there. Do like this. And what is your name? Shay. Everybody say hey to Shay. Hey, hey Shay. Come on over that way, man. Go over to the wife. Yeah. This is brand new. I just want you to know we didn't use it. <laughs> it's on, fresh. On it's over. crisp. It's all good. On over. Okay. So, stop about right about here. Okay, make sure it's tight. Spin it so it's so it's kind of tight. And I'm gonna have two more volunteers. Well, three more volunteers. But pretty soon everybody's gonna be involved. <laughs> no singing involved. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it? All right, so. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> Let's do it again. Come on, Matt. I know. I need to. So there you go, just like that. Make it tight. Keep going. There's a reason. There's, there's a method to my magnet. I'm just saying. Right about there. Okay, so. Um, Shay, you're going to stand right here. Oh, actually, we need one more person. Can you come up? You're going to hold this. Ah, oh, he's going to hold it. And Shay, you're going to write on it. So you go, there you go. This is practice for next week when I have to present this for someone else. <laughs> All right. There we go. So now, the history of black gospel music. Next, please. So gospel is defined. We're going to define gospel music. We're going to show you the history of it. We're going to go through gospel music pioneers. We're going to go through the gospel eras. And we're going to do formant analysis, and we're going to do emotional, emotional peaks, and then we're going to do hopefully passing out our devil savior. Move on, please. Gospel music uh, is gospel. Word gospel is Eli, uh, eugelion, uh, which means good news. Good news is God has sent Jesus to save the entire world. For God so loved the world, He gave so many begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Next. So let's define gospel music. Dr. Raymond Wise says African American sacred music genre that developed, was developed in the 1920s and 1930s when the African American jazz and blues artists came to church. They went to church, y'all, and they began to combine jazz and blues music and rhythms with the spirituals and the hymns of the church. Next. So there were two basic strains of, Af of American gospel music. There was the white gospel music, which has its roots in the European Protestant church brought to America via immigration. That right there is an interesting study because they brought it from Europe in their mountains and came over here to Virginia and Pennsylvania and the Carolinas and Kentucky. Have you heard? As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, right? That's, that's the white gospel. Then we have American gospel, our black gospel, which has its roots in West Africa. The slaves brought it over to America, and the Africans heard the music of their new environment, and they embraced it, and then infused um, what we call their musical ex expression, the African aesthetic, and cultivated from the West African culture. Next. There are seven African, I mean, seven African-American sacred genres, according to Dr. Raymond Wise. There's psalmody, there's line singing, there is shape note singing. How many of you heard of shape note singing? Shape note singing, spirituals, there's hymnody, congregational spirituals. Somebody say congregational spirituals. Congregational spirituals. And then standard classic art music, which is oh freedom, oh freedom. Standard art music. Got it? Next. <laughs> then we spiritually, the, the characteristics of the spiritual is the pentatonic scale, in tone words, vocal slides, 
vocal improvisation, call and response, and syncopation. So when you go to a black church, you're going to hear all of that. You're going to hear all of that. You're going to hear a, pentac um, a pentatonic scale. You're going to hear, and Jesus said, when I see the cross, I'm going to lay my head down. Well, can we say yeah? That's what, that's what they call it. You bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> that's the tone word, right? And then you have the vocal slides and vocal improvisation. Um, uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that a rich. That right there is vocal slides open for Improvisation, and then we call in response. Let's see, let's see. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 There you go. Amen. Got it. Next slide, please. All of that is from the spiritual. Then we have the history of gospel music. We've got all of that blues, art song, spiritual, male quartets. Did you, did, you, did you get that power from the mighty clouds of joy? Um, the congregational, pay attention to this one. Congregational, spiritual, the concert, spiritual, and the music theater. All of that comes from the Negro spiritual. Some, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wise says this, this quartet, the male quartet, barbershop quartet. And he was saying music theater from, um, oh gosh, it escaped me right now, Bartville. Vaudeville from musical theater, and concert spirituals, and then you know you have the blues and everything. Next, please. Now all of that fed into the, this. All, all of these fed into gospel music. Black hymnody, white hymnody, instruments. Play the piano for me, brother. Jazz and blues. We've got quartet music, and they were all in the, in the storefront churches. So they took. <laughs> they're all in the storefront churches so they took, they went from the field to factory next now we're getting to somewhere so now, what I'd like for you to do is write Negro Spiritual right here, on the paper towel, on the paper towel. Don't, break it, don't, break it. don't break it, don't break it paper towel, right so the Negro Spiritual started with the slaves singing um, oh freedom, oh freedom, you know and um and after, what was the other one? Oh, gosh, I can't remember the name of that song. So many songs going through my head now. My ADHD is kicking in. Um, they would sing, Oh, Freedom. And so after they free, after the slaves were free, move on over. What's your name? Joe. Joe? Come on over, Joe. Joe or Joel? Joe. Oh, okay. Don't oh, right. tear up my timeline. All right, there you go. About right, right about here. Let's say, let's put that there. Right here, Thomas Dorsey. Put the jazz idiom and cadences, right, Thomas Dorsey, uh, and created what we call now gospel music. He and Sally Martin and Mahalia Jackson, they're the ones that made sure that um, gospel music was on the scene. So you got them? Thomas Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey, right there. Gotcha. Now, let's move back here because, ooh. There you go. Right about here. I want you to put, right there, I want you to put the Fisk Jubilee Singers. The Fisk Jubilee Singers made the Negro spiritual famous. They took it world, F-I-S-A. They took it around the world, to England and all around parts of the United States. Fisk Jubilee Singers. The Fisk? Yes. What's the full name? Fisk Jubilee. Jubilee. Yes, ma'am. Fisk Jubilee Singers. <laughs> There you go. Now, Miss Joe, let me go with this. You just move this down. Hey, there you go. That's it. No, it, it's fine. It's fine. Because we've got Omi over here making sure that it doesn't break. So now, move on up, please. Next slide. Did it break? Okay. Next, next one. All right, so somewhere around the middle of between where we're going to go to here is James Cleveland. So put James Cleveland there. The reason I'm putting James Cleveland there is because he was a protege of Thomas Dorsey, the father of gospel music. So James Cleveland 
presented and produced Gospel Music Workshop of America. And I want you to put right about here, quartets. Quartets. Yes. Can I say quartets? Quartets. And not quartets. They were quartets. My mom would call them quartets. <laughs> quartet music, ensembles, small ensembles, and quartet music right here. The reason I'm putting that there is because James Cleveland, that's how he gained his experience with quartet music. He would be with all kinds of gospel ensembles. Quartet music. And so about right here, I want you to put... Right here, I want you to put 1962, Peace Be Still. In 1962, this album called Peace Be Still, written by James Cleveland, <laughs> was produced and written by him. And that was one of the first times that, uh, thank you for coming, man. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> that was the first time that gospel music, the world was introduced to gospel music. It won Grammys and people know it, right? Now let's move on over here to, now this is where I'm going to need somebody. Ma'am, can you come here, please? Sure. Oh, the last one, if they need somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Movement, put right there, that's the Jesus Movement. And what is your name? Kim. Kim, okay. All right, <laughs> this is gonna be difficult right here. <laughs> All right, Kim, I don't know if you, I, th I thought I got the, like, the, the toilet paper that could, like, roll. I think, I think, huh? <laughs> All right, so Kim's going to hold this. Okay. Kim's going to hold this. So we got, we got the Jesus Movement. And from the Jesus Movement came, let's put it down this way. From the Jesus Movement came Andre Crouch, Edwin Hawkins. Yes, ma'am. All right, Andrew. Andre. Andre. Andre Crouch. C-R-O-U-C-H. Yep. Uh-huh. And we got Edwin Hawkins. <laughs> um, James Cleveland. He was still there. And down here, I'm going to put Walter Hawkins. But we're going to move this. Hold it, hold it, hold it. We're gonna move this down this way so you can write Walter Hawkins on there. This on the tissue? Yep, on the tissue. Walter Hawkins. Yep. I got this. There we go. I don't have the two hands. That's fine, yeah. Oh, this is delicate. <laughs> I need to find like the stronger We're gonna get you some more paper. Hey, Walter. <laughs> Walter Hawkins. This is like a, a, a general like. Michael was trying to figure out like oh, one of those roles of Michael. Michael's. Yeah. Oh my goodness. All right, Michael. Good. Well, set me up. Please. 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 All right, so this is what I call, if you st Miss Kim, stand behind. So we can see your face. Oh, okay. Yeah, do a little <laughs> twirl. Go. There we go. And then okay. put this up here. So this is my, what I'm going to call my living timeline <laughs> of gospel music. It starts with the slaves. Go down Moses, way down in Egypt, Negro spiritual. This Jubilee Singers made it famous. Thomas Dorsey was around at that time, and he knew about the spirituals, and so he created gospel music. He had um, a protege by the name of James Cleveland, who got all of his experience in the quartet sounds and everything, and I would see, he would go straight through, he, went, he, he created Peace Be Still, and in the Jesus movement, boom, a lot of things exploded. Uh, CCM, I'll put CCM here, but CCM, um, Calvary Chapel, and then the explosion of African American music or gospel. And that included Andre Crouch, Edwin Hawkins, James Cleveland, and Walter Hawkins. And if we move further down, you could put, come on down, Miss Jet Shea. <laughs> Kirk Franklin. Oh. <laughs> 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 Matthew's like, finally, a name I know. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt Franklin, all right? And, and everybody that Kurt Franklin is familiar with. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've just created, don't be created my, well, gently, create my timeline, <laughs> my living timeline of the history of gospel music. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
Can they sit down? You can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing about it is, even now, even nowadays, every genre of gospel music, every genre of African American art, um, sacred music is being played today. You've got the, the O'Neill twins, you've got the um, Five Blind Boys of Mississippi, you've got, um, it, what's the other, Mighty Clouds of Joy, yeah, Mighty Clouds of Joy, and people are still singing the Negro spirituals. They're still singing that type of that music. So all of this, they're still singing Roberta Martins. How many of you heard this song? Um, Praise, praise, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all free, right? So Miss Roberta Martin changed it. Bum, ba da, um, ba da, ba da. Praise God from whom all bless. So she changed that back in 1940 and made it made it our style. So we got Roberta Martin and Kenneth, Kenneth Morris was the one who created and helped create the Hammond organ. Long and and then the three part harmony. Next slides, please. James Cleveland, Maddie Moss Clark perfected the three part harmony. Hammond organ, love the Hammond organ. Yeah, Hammond organ sound like somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Aaron Hawkins did some extended chords. That's what when we were playing, I heard the voice of Jesus say. Yeah. That those were like jazz. Those were jazz chords. They were jazz chords, totally different. Thank you all for your help. Totally different from the Negro spiritual. And then Andre Crouch, he added the rock sound, you know, in the 1960s and the 70s, which made music more secular to the ear. And he spanned both spectrums. He wrote, and he also wrote hymns. This one, The Blood Shall Never Lose Its Power, is found in white, hymn, white church hymnals as well as African American hymnals. Next slide, please. And then um, we have the ministry, which is where Kirk Franklin comes into play. Kirk Franklin and also. Um, Urban hip hop in the 1990s, uh, the reason why I sing, James, John P. Key, Hezekiah Walker, Yolanda Adams, Kirk Franklin, Fred Hammond, all of these people were influenced by James Cleveland and the Hawkins family, who was also influenced by Thomas Dorsey, who was influenced by the Negro Spirit. And so, next slide, please. Next slide, I'm, I'm not gonna go there. You find when you, when you find when you hear a black gospel choir scene, you 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 hear more um, the Hammond the Hammond organ, the bass, guitar, drums, and and the piano, three part harmony for choral music, um, rhythm and blues. Keep going to the next one. So for for black gospel music and choirs, there's usually an introduction. Can you play one look at Jesus? We'll pay for it all. Use it as an introduction. And usually the people, the choir, it's, it's a three-part harmony. And um, you would, were you here when I did my concert last last year? One look as you would pay for it all? You would remember, you would have said, oh yeah, I remember that. Um, we don't have time, but I would teach you this song that's called One Look at Jesus Will Pay For It All. That's all it is. One look at Jesus will pay for it all. That's all it is. One look at Jesus will pay for it all. Try it. One look at Jesus will pay for it all. One more time. One look at Jesus will pay for it all. Oh, what joy just to see him face to face. Oh, what joy just to see him face to face. Try one more joy. Oh, what joy just to see him face to face. So that's very that's a very simple song, very gospel gospelish, where we have all three parts playing, all three parts singing. We don't have enough people, but I would do it. I would teach you. We don't have people next week. And the typical gospel keys for black gospel music are E flat, D flat, G flat, A flat, F, C, and G. If you would hear all of the songs that the Hawkins family would play, or uh, like, let the church say amen, let the church, that's the whinings. The whinings uh, was influenced by Andre Crouch, right? And let the church say amen is in the key of D-flat. Let the church say amen, God has spoken, so let the church say amen. And so the format for a gospel song would be the introduction, the verse, the chorus, 
and then the improvisation that the soloist would do. And then there's that, that shout chorus. Mm -hmm. People just clap. Joy, joy, joy comes in the morning. Joy, joy, joy comes in the morning. They can do that all night long. And people wonder, why is black church so long? Well, because of the shout. The shout chorus. <laughs> That's it, I'm telling you. If you listen to a black gospel song, chorus, I mean verse, verse one, verse two, a chorus, is usually done in less than four minutes yeah. until you get to the shout chorus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's when the, the soloist will improvise, and that two or three minute, four minute song ends up being 10 minutes. <laughs> um, Hezekiah Walker, his, his wife, uh, she sang about the blind man. She sang about the drunk man. Oh, uh, it was, it was, uh, I can't remember the name of that song, but it was, my goodness, that two or three minute song lasted 10 minutes. Mm. She improvised. <laughs> she improvised. Next slide, please. Uh, and then a running bass line. You want to try to play that, my brother? Yeah. That's the shout music. We had a bass player, you know. And the keyboard would come in on the next one. The running bass line, shout music, next please. Yes. These what I call um, emotional peaks. Every mountain, um, um, every mountain has an emotional peak. I call it with a, it has a bow tie sound to it. Um, Ms. Tyler, do we have one, about five minutes where I can well, I can pull this up on YouTube. Yes. Okay, so go up on you. Thank you, sir. Go to YouTube and pull up Keith Pringle. Call him up. Call him up by Keith Pringle. There you go. Now, uh, yeah, go ahead and put it on mute because we're gonna have you know commercials. <laughs> Um, I should have brought this up. This is on the spur of the moment. I'm thinking about this. Um, did, I, did I do it? Give me one second. All right. So this came out in 1982, I think. And <laughs> it, it starts out really, really loud. It's like a bow tie. So it starts really loud, and then it angles down to, to soft um, for the verses. And then we get the Can't Stop Praising His Name, and then we get to delight thyself in the Lord and, so, and then it can't stop praising his name and that's where we have the shout chorus. All right, so here's the bow tie effect. Try it. So it's clap your hands really loud. Can you make that smaller so we can show that? Can you make that smaller so we can show the bow tie effect? But we can still, can we still play it? I think we can. There you go. See what I mean? You guys know how to do stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> go down, I believe we're keep down, go down, keep down, right about there. This one. Is that it? Yes. Okay, now go ahead and play the play that. And I'll let you go. So we're about right here. The large, large bull tie area is loud. Now, it may sound really loud, but 
people about right here in the middle of it. We're talking about the emotional, the emotional area that it brings. We went up to the next one. About right there, yeah. That's the verse. Right there. Right there. Right now we're in the shop chorus. It's about, now we're about right here. And it's just going to go on for days. You can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name. And clap your hands. Come on, put your hands together. Right? Okay, let's stop for a minute. So now what we're doing right now is basically the song is over. The verses have been sung, the chorus has been sung, and we're now at the shout chorus, which will last until the cows come home. And what's going to happen is the choir is going to come in, they're going to sing, and then you're going to, the choir director is going to pull the instrumentalists out, mm -hmm. and they're still going to sing, you know, and then they're going to do some fun stuff. Mm -hmm. That's gospel music. <coughs> that is the best music I grew up with, and I grew up on, from the 1982, 1983, I got saved in 81, and so I cut my teeth on this. So anyway, you can do the same thing when I was with almost any music. But have you heard Total Praise? Lord, I will lift my eyes to the hill. So you go here, and then oh, in my heaven, and then he goes, um, You are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. And then he, Amen. Ah, and it builds up to the end. Builds up to the end. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I can go on and on and on. Somebody's got to stop me. I'm going to stop myself. <laughs> that is the history of gospel music. That's the history of the black church. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, which church do you go to? Oh, I go to all people's church here, here in Lynchburg. Okay. It's not a black church, but it's, a, it's all people's church. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? Ms. Tyler, thank you very much. Thank you to the um, Forest, uh, Forest Library uh, and Bedford Library um, conglomerate. I appreciate it. And thank you for coming, everybody. Most end of this lecture. Thank you.